So this is my disclosures. The, so uh, first I will review uh, shortly the background, so what we know about PrEP, what's wor what works for PrEP. Then uh, can we have better options for PrEP? And I will review the uh, long-acting HIV drugs and the evidence we have on, on this. And then lastly, the pros and cons. Uh, as a background, we know that the, the antiretroviral drugs has become uh, the cornerstone for HIV prevention. As, be, as it has been said before, on treatment as prevention, or uh, we know that also for the, for the post-exposure prophylaxis, and mainly for the PrEP, for the pre-exposure prophylaxis. We, in, uh, sorry. Uh, we know that the, the PrEP wars, there are several clinical trials. The first one was the, the IPREX, showing a, a protection or reduction of HIV incidence of 44%. But then there has... There have been two more studies, European, European studies, implemented among MSM and transgender women, which is the PROUT study and the hypergay study. The differences are the, the, they are with oral uh, PrEP, with Truvada, but the difference is that the PROUT, in the PROUT study, which is the British one, the, the Truvada was daily, on a daily basis, whereas in the, in the Hypergay study, uh, implemented in France and Canada, the was on demand. So uh, you take, there was a group on, on a daily Truvada and another group, the, another arm was on demand, which means that they uh, took the, the Truvada only when they uh, were going to have sex or they have planned to have sex, which this, this modality this way could, could be uh, suitable for those people who, uh, is, who are not so active, or so sexually active, because uh, uh, maybe you are surprised, but there are people who don't have sex every day, and <laughs> be, be, believe me. And <laughs> And the rest of the studies also have shown uh, 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 an efficacy, except two studies uh, implemented among women, among African women. It's the, the FEMPREP and the VOICE study, uh, where there was no, uh, they didn't show any pro uh, no, no protection or not enough protection. Uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Paredes was uh, explaining us about the effect of the dysbiosis uh, in, in women, vaginal, and uh, this could be an explanation. But in this case, clearly, the, the explanation of, for this lack of uh, efficacy was the, the lack of adherence. Uh, you can see in the, the FEMPREP and the VOICE, the, the, the last two studies, the adherence was, was low. No? So we know the PrEP wars when you take it, when the uh, adherence is good. And uh, what about in real world? Uh, also this morning, uh, uh, David presented a, a study from the Kaiser Permanente in, in California. They recently has, have published this one, which is uh, uh, it, the, with more people, more MSM on PrEP. They already have almost 5,000 people on PrEP in California. And in this period of time, between July 2012 and 2017, the same results, no new infections. Any new infections among these 5,000 MSM. That's real world. Uh, so we know that the oral PrEP wars, but can or could we have better options for PrEP? Uh, well, I would say, I think so, I think yes. I'm going to focus on the long-acting formulations for this, uh, these two HIV uh, this, uh, antiretroviral drugs, the Rilpivirin and uh, Cabotegravir. But I'm going to focus on the studies implemented on prevention. I'm not, and the, we, ha we have this uh, study for the Rilpivirin, which is the HPTN 076. It's a, a phase two study to assess the safety and acceptability of the long-acting rilpivirin, and it was uh, this study was implemented uh, on uh, in women at low risk for HIV infection. It's 136 women, and the, there was an oral phase during four weeks. Uh, then women were receiving rilpivirin, oral rilpivirin, and after that they received the long-acting injections uh, uh, followed 
followed by eight weeks. Uh, this, this injection at the intervals of uh, eight weeks. They presented these results and, well, they say that the, the long-acting injections of ruripivirine uh, were safe, overall well tolerate, tolerated and acceptable for, for women. That's what we know about the ruripivirine. We have more information uh, about the cabotegravir for prevention and uh, there are these four clinical trials uh, f uh, about cabotegravir. The last one, the CLERA study, it's already completed. And I'm going to focus on these studies. I'm going to comment uh, some results. The HPTN 077, it's a, say, a phase two, uh, assessing the, also the tolerability and acceptability of the long-acting cabotegravir versus placebo. The study population were uh, almost 200 uh, men and women at low risk of infection. This is important to, to point out that they were at low risk. And uh, it's going to be finished by this summer. Uh, results were also presented at the last uh, conference. In, and in the, well, this is the, the design. There were two cohorts, the first cohort uh, one arm was receiving the uh, cabotegravir, an oral phase, four weeks of oral cabotegravir, followed by the injection, the long-acting injectable. Uh, at the dose was eight, 800 milligrams every 12 weeks. And the, another arm received the placebo, an oral phase, and then a uh, placebo injection. The cohort two, it was the same scheme, but they receive the placebo, the cabotegravir, the active arm, uh, received 600 milligrams every eight weeks, and uh, the, the placebo group was the same, but with placebo every eight weeks. Uh, some some results in terms of adverse events, the, there were no important differences except for the injection site reaction. They reported that uh, participants on the cabotegravir, the active uh, arm, reported much more uh, uh, pain in the uh, injection site pain, and also there was a difference uh, regarding the headache, as we expect, because we know that the injection is usually is, is, is painful, and this is the main complaint of, of our, our patients, in this case, no patients. Uh, other significant clinic, uh, other adverse events reported, uh, it's, this is a list, uh, there were only 12 uh, discontinuations because adverse events, there were six serious adverse events, and I, I would like to focus on the seroconversions because they were, there were two seroconversions. Uh, so there was, oh, sorry, there was one uh, seroconversion in the cabotegravy group, but this seroconversion was detected at week 77 which uh, is 48 weeks after the final injection. And no levels, no cabotegravir levels were detected at week for 53 and 77. So the, definitely that, that, per, that participant became infected uh, with no cabotegravir levels, at least not detectable cabotegravir levels. No? It was by, uh, infected by a wild child virus. As a summary, they, for this study, they say that the, the both doses of 800 and 600 were uh, well tolerated in males and females, that the injection site reactions were very frequent, but generally mild, and only the, there was only one discontinuation because of this adverse event, and that the 600 milligrams every uh, eight weeks met the pre-specified PK targets for both sexes. I'm going to talk more, a little bit more of the Eclair study. The Eclair study is also a phase two to assess the safety and tolerability of the cabotegravir long-acting injection. But uh, in this case, the population, the study population was men at low risk for infection, defined by at least one casual partner, sex partner in the past 24 months, and no more than three within the within three months of screening. So really not a very active uh, uh, population, sexually active population. The design is this one, uh, two arms, one with the cabotegravir, always uh, oral phase for four weeks, 
to to be sure that they don't have any adverse event, which couldn't be managed if uh, we start with an injection, a long-acting injection, as is, has been said before, and followed by in one the active farm with the with the 800 milligrams of cabotegravir every 12 weeks and another arm with a placebo injection and up to week 41 and then the follow ups of, uh, there was the follow up period uh, some results regarding the pharmacokinetics they observed that the cabotegravir absorption was faster than expected but concentrations, especially at the end of the, the 12 weeks period, were lower than expected, so, which means that probably we, we, will, we will have to, to administer this every eight weeks and the protection will not last for up to 12 weeks. And uh, uh, seroconversions in this study, there were two seroconversions, one in the uh, uh, placebo arm and one in the cabotegravir arm. This was a 20 year, 22 years old man and the, the seroconversion, the infection was detected at week 53, which means 24 weeks after the final injection. As you can see in, the, in that table, at the, at the, the moment of the, the infection, the, week 50, the detection of the infection at week 50, 53 was a very high viral load and no the quantifiable uh, levels of cabotegravir. This uh, subject uh, had reported having had sex, unprotected sex, condomless sex, uh, with uh, an, a sex partner between the, the visits in the weeks 41 and, 40 and 53. So probably this visit was, this infection was by that period. Uh, regarding the, the adverse events, it's uh, again the pain is the most common uh, side uh, adverse event, and it's a difference is statistically significant. And I'm going to, to spend more time on this. When we ask about the, when they ask sorry about the tolerability and when uh, they were asked about the pain or discomfort they they felt, uh, they most of the placebo arm say that they didn't have uh, pain, but in the uh, capotegravir they reported um, uh, pain and more, very much more often. But interestingly, when they were asked about the satisfaction with the adverse events, uh, the, the difference was not so, so important. So the capotegravir uh, arm, the, uh, the participants and the capotegravir arm reported more pain, but not much more or less satisfaction with the, with the, the study. Mm -hmm. When they ask about the, how satisfied would they be to, uh, to continue with the, the present form of medication, you see that at the beginning, no important differences were more or less the same. Most of them were satisfied, and uh, at the end, at the week, well, at the end, at week 30, uh, there were a slight difference between the cabotegravir and the placebo arm. So more uh, willing to continue to continue with the medication, those on the on the placebo arm. And this is a sub study is interesting because it's a qualitative study. It was performed uh, on. Uh, through 30 uh, interviews to participants and health providers. <coughs> and uh, almost, mm, almost all of them said that they had experienced pain and in, in temporarily injection site uh, pain. But in spite of that, they reported that they, they were satisfied and interested in continuing the cabotegravir. And they described the convenience of the, this long-acting formulation because for them uh, there was a, an important advantage. It was not to be worried about not missing a dose. They, they didn't have to worry about taking the pill every day. And uh, some of the participants who were talking about the, this kind of peace of mind, so you are very, you can be much more uh, comfortable and. and Sorry, and uh, and this is uh, they said that in that these participants were from New York and San Francisco, the the ones who participated in this study, and they said that uh, uh, in San Francisco uh, there is a culture 
where you are expected to be uh, on PrEP. In fact, one of the guys, uh, in, I work also uh, in a hospital, but also in a community center where we provide PrEP, and one of the participants was uh, telling uh, uh, that when he, he was living in San Francisco, and when he arrived to San Francisco, San Francisco he was not on PrEP, and everybody uh, was asking him, but, you, are you crazy? Why are you, not, why are you not on PrEP? When he came back to Barcelona, uh, it was the opposite, no? because he already was on PrEP, and everybody, he told me, everybody asked me, but why are you taking PrEP? Are you crazy? <laughs> so it's uh, just these cultural differences. Anyway, this, I, I would like to, to point out these two sentences of the two of the participants. The first one, uh, to, to highlight that for these participants, it was very important not to remember every day about having the pill. And the second one for them, for him, was important and the need for, no need for planning. So he said, because we live in a hook up culture, uh, you don't need to plan if you are going to have sex, because if you are on daily prep, you. You, we, we recommend to, uh, well, we can guarantee the full protection after seven days, seven days, and if they are taking the on-demand prep at least two hours before. So you need some kind of planification. Uh, I'd like to do uh, just a very quick survey. Uh, if you, among you, so if you were going to take prep, uh, what would you prefer? The daily oral prep or the long-acting prep? Please raise your hands who would prefer the daily oral prep. Okay. And who would prefer the long-acting uh, prep? Okay. Right. Well, I see that there is a majority of people preferring the second option. And, well, I see that you like you are that kind of people who like to be always ready for action, and <laughs> that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the another study is the HPTN 083. It's also a phase two, and uh, uh, it's, sorry, it's a phase two three. In this case, the objective is to reduce the HIV incidence, and the inclusion inclusion criteria, as you can see, are. Uh, uh, or it's a population of high risk uh, defined by this criteria, or having had an STI, or being uh, users of chemsex, or having um, more uh, sex partners. So uh, the important uh, issue in this clinical trial is that uh, no placebo arm, because it wouldn't be ethical, to implement a study with placebo among this uh, high-risk population. And this, the, the study, the design is, is the same. It's, well, it's the same. It's with, uh, after an oral phase of cabochegravir compared, in this case, with Truvada, with oral Truvada. And then a second phase uh, comparing the uh, long-acting cabochegravir with the Truvada. It's a double dummy study, so the uh, dub, uh, double blind double blind, uh, double dummy study. And uh, another important issue to which I would like to highlight, is that the, the, there was uh, the follow-up after they have stopped the cabotegravir injections, they were, they were administered uh, through WADA in order to protect them for this, uh, because we know that there is a long PK tail where if you become infected, then there could be that risk for, getting, for, for developing resistance. The, the study uh, is like this, as I said, I said one arm with uh, cabotegravir long acting and another one with the Truada. And this is also the, uh, another uh, clinical trial, the HPTN 084, the same design, but this is implemented among women, mainly uh, African women, but uh, you can see it's the same, the same design. Huh? So we, we have the results. Uh, to finish, to just to, uh, I'm going to repeat some of the 
uh, pros and cons which have been but uh, mentioned before but these are refer specifically to to for the for prevention for prep and as already been said that if you have some you present some adverse event then it's going it's difficult to manage if it's a long acting injection the pain it's very common and it's a complaint which could uh, could Many people could be uh, not willing to have this pain every time he gets the infection. This the already set uh, potential risk for uh, resistance. And uh, important, uh, if the long-acting formulation, in this case the cabotegravir, can only be prescribed at hospitals, that could be a barrier because uh, there is a very interesting study implemented among uh, MSM and uh, asking them, it's a Euro European study, and they, they were asked about uh, where they would prefer receive the PrEP. And they said 85% said that the, for them the best place would be a community center or a, for the, a primary care by the, the GPs. So if it's only going to be prescribed at, and administered at the hospital, this could be an important barrier. Uh, pros, uh, it's already been said, we would expect better adherence and satisfaction. We've seen that in spite of the pain, it's been high. And what we mentioned before, that uh, peace of mind and no need for planning. And also, we would expect uh, less toxicity. And as a conclusion, well, we know that the oral prep works but uh, this efficacy is strongly related to adherence and that the long-acting formulation could overcome barriers to the adherence and this could be preferred by many potential users and uh, the, the cabotegravir is a potent integrase inhibitor that formulated as an injectable could be a promising option for PrEP. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.